by the way, you have a lovely community here. Uh, if I'm not speaking and not traveling, I love to come here and learn from everybody. So thank you for having me again. Um, and so many people, so many people. Wow, this reminds me of uh, like a typical Indian wedding. With, <laughs> that's good, without, without the uh, music and the butter chicken, which that probably is the worst thing to say when starting a talk on bias and discrimination. But, <laughs> But we'll, we'll, we'll go with that, it's okay. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk to you about a, uh, bias in AI and machine learning models. Um, so just show of hands, how many people here do machine learning um, on like a regular basis? Very cool. Um, okay, cool, so, so a lot of people perhaps new to this topic. Um, if you wanna chime in at, at any point, please do so. And I know they're strict on time, so I'm gonna rush through the first couple of slides, but I do wanna set uh, like a baseline. <laughs> So when you talk about fairness, two, two questions, right? What is fairness? Why do we care? Second one, sort of easier to answer. We care because nobody wants to be treated unfairly, right? And especially now where um, almost every decision about my life and your lives is probably has input from some sort of data science or a machine learning model or AI model. So be it you know, applying to a college, getting a loan, getting a mortgage, you know, applying for a credit card, whatever that may be. Um, and the problem is the, uh, you know, basically, human minds, we already have some sort of bias or discrimination existing, right? Uh, it may not be at, at a conscious level, but it's there. And what we're doing with, uh, with these models is we are scaling it immensely and we are automating all of that bias. So it's not a, bad th uh, not a good thing. Um, in terms of what is fairness, how do you define it? There's a talk by uh, a professor in Narayanan, uh, 2018. I will share that link with everybody. If you go listen to him, he comes, he's come up with 21 different kinds of metrics for fairness. There are people who have come up, come up with a lot more. It's a relatively new subject. Uh, lots of papers written on it as well. Um, the thing is, uh, there's a lot of definitions and there's a reason to that because fairness by itself, it's a really vague thing to talk about and discuss. But given a specific problem and given a context and given uh, a stakeholder, it becomes really concrete and relevant. Right, um, And also he talks about um, a lot of ethical issues that go behind a lot of these uh, metrics. Because fairness, again, it's, it's, in, it's um, how do you say, it's, it's a very emotional topic, right? So it's very touchy-feely, it's, it's, uh, ha it's, it has an effect on our lives. Um, and the last point here, the, the way you define fairness impacts bias. So you, you have to come up with the right metric. And I'll give you some examples on how that can go wrong. Um, but just defining fairness, so <clears throat> that is a hard problem by itself. So in 2018, there's a company, Pew Research, I think it's called, they did, did a study on Google Images, and they found that when you search the word CEO on Google Images, 11% um, of images on the first page are female CEOs, and the rest um, are male. Uh, but in 2018, when they did this research, 27% of CEOs in the US were females. So that obviously seems unfair to show only 11% females on the, on the page. But then the question is, what is the right percentage to show? Right? Do you show 27% because there are 27% females, or do you show 50% because half of the population is female? So those are some of the questions that you need to ask to the right stakeholders before you can define fairness for your use case. Uh, that's just one example. Here's another example. This is a software by the name of Compass, and this was, to, um, this was developed by a company called North Point. Who's heard of this before? Oh, okay, so all the machine learning people again? <laughs> so essentially what the software did was it was used in the jail systems to um, figure out what are the chances of somebody recommitting a crime or committing a crime again after parole, after they were uh, released from prison. And um, ProPublica did a research where it found that uh, this uh, software was systematically discriminating against African Americans. Um, um, double, so it was, it was uh, um, it was giving them a high-risk score uh, twice as many times that, as it was giving high-risk scores to uh, white defendants, right? So I'm giving you an example of these two people, but when we talk about fairness, when we talk about uh, bias, uh, it's usually systematic and it's usually over a long period of time. So they have done studies on the data they got from the jail systems and, and, and this is what they have found. Now, what people usually don't talk about is ProPublica, in their defense, said they actually did a lot of research um, and made sure that the algorithm was actually not biased. And what had happened was they had looked at something called statistical dis uh, uh, disparity, um, which is different, um, which essentially, actually, let me, let me confirm that. 
It's funny how you forget things when you come up on the stage. Um, statistical parity difference. That's the metric they were looking at. And that's essentially, they were looking at how many uh, f number of favorable, favorable outcomes for um, African Americans versus white, and it was about the same. So 62% of the times, um, you know, the, both the groups were given a low risk. But ProPublica said what they should have looked for was false positives, and that's what they didn't do, and there was a big difference between the false positive rates between the two groups. So that there, again, there's two different metrics, and based on the use case, you may want to look at um, you know, which, um, one of the two. Here's another example. So Amazon uh, had to scrape their um, uh, automated AI recruiting tool, and essentially what this did, this, this tool was trained on last 10 years of resume data, and it so happens that, like we all know, in this industry, um, there's you know, um, a more number of male or men software engineers applying for positions. And so the algorithm learned a lot of terms from the resume that were male specific. And so automatically, it started giving, uh, or it started filtering out resumes that had things like um, um, captain of the women's soccer club. Right? That automatically meant maybe they are not, maybe this person would not be a good candidate for this position. Um, so that's, again, uh, a more recent example of how, uh, you know, bias affects all of us. This, I, this was not on the slide. I just took this recently, and I'm sure people have seen this. So this is the creator of Ruby on Rails, and he is complaining how, uh, why his wife, or how his wife got a lot less uh, uh, credit limit than, him, than himself by Apple Card. Um, so again, this is just one example. It doesn't prove that, you know, their system is discriminating against women but it's enough to start an investigation in this matter, right? So it's a very, so the point here being it's a very, very re relevant topic. All right, so now we have defined what fairness is. Let me check on time too. Okay, now that we have defined what fairness is and why it's important, uh, here is a toolkit that will help you. It's an open source toolkit uh, that'll help you detect um, bias based on certain metrics and then also help you mitigate those biases. Uh, it's got 75 plus fairness metrics, it's called AI Fairness 360, and it's got 10 plus, uh, more than 10 mitigation algorithms. Um, it's completely open source, IBM is a big contributor. Um, the, the part I like is it's designed to translate new research from lab and academia into a working uh, code, right? So all of these, mo all of these um, algorithms are backed by research papers, so you can actually go and take a look. Oh, and the other thing is, if you've, if you've used Scikit-Learn, they use a very similar model in their API. So if you're using um, AI Fairness 360, uh, they, they follow that fit predict paradigm that Scikit-Learn has. All right, so where does this bias come from, right? So now we know there is bias, where does it come from? A lot of people say it probably comes from your model, your model learns it over time. Uh, but even before that, a lot of it comes from your data, right? So the two ways you can introduce bias, one is oversampling, the other one is undersampling. And as the picture shows here, there's a majority group, which is blue, there is a minority group, which is orange, and to, uh, to make my training set uh, the this, this same number of data points in each group, um, in oversampling, I essentially, one way to do that would be to make copies of my minority, minority group. Not the best thing to do, but that happens a lot. Uh, undersampling is the other way around. Instead of making copies of my, or duplicating my minority group, I could take a subset or a sample of my majority group, and the problem there is, my sample may not represent the whole population in the majority group. Um, so here's an example. MIT did a study of top facial recognition services. IBM also has one, so IBM being one. And they found that the model worked really well for light, lighter skinned males, and it worked really bad for darker skinned females. And after this, a couple of years later, IBM released um, uh, this open data set. I think it's from Flickr, uh, Creative Commons. It's one million faces that you know, they, they think would help uh, uh, fight this bias. So they're trying to overcome this problem of not enough data on minority females uh, as one example. Here's another example. This is a map of uh, New York. So the problem here is people say, okay, so we understand maybe race or your skin color or gender or age is a problem. Just take that out, take that attribute out of your data set. The problem there is there could be other proxy attributes or hidden attributes that correlate really well with your protected attribute, we call it, right? Um, so here, the example here is this process was called redlining. This is a map of Brooklyn from 1977, and essentially bankers would have this map on their table, and they would uh, take a red pen and draw circles around areas where they do not want to give a loan out, right? So they're actually biasing or discriminating based on zip code, even though they're, they're, prop, they're, you know, they're not looking at specifically gender or income levels. 
but the zip code is very much correlated with those uh, attributes. So uh, some terms before we move on. So I've been talking about protected attributes. So if you know, uh, it's you can probably tell that's essentially the attribute uh, based on which biasing is happening or discrimination is happening. Uh, group fairness, or, or, uh, the, so group fairness versus individual fairness, these are just two lenses through which you can look at fairness, and I'll, I'll give you an example later. But essentially you're uh, discriminating in, uh, between individuals or between groups of, of individuals. Uh, fairness metric, again, it's, a, it's a, usually a num some sort of a number um, that, uh, will, uh, that, that tells you if there is a bias or not. Um, and then... Here are some of the uh, metrics that I talked about before, right? So statistical parity difference is essentially the number of difference between the fair, uh, favorable outcomes between two groups, so the privileged group and unprivileged group. So in this case, you can see there's uh, six positives out of 10, um, so there's a 60% favorable outcome, versus here there's seven out of 10, and so there is a difference of 10%. Uh, disparate impact is the same thing in a ratio form, so a lot of these metrics are ratio, a lot of them are numbers. Uh, and then at the bottom here, equal opportunity is looking at the true, true positive rate between your favorable and unfavorable. So if you, excuse me, if you haven't looked into machine learning, uh, a lot of these things are coming from a confusion matrix where you have, you know, the predicted value and the actual value, and, and it's, it's a simple table. Um, does anybody know why it's called confusion matrix? Confused. I have no idea, but it is. Conf I think that's a very good name for that for that table. Uh, it's so hard to remember. All right. So these are just three. So remember, we said there are 75 plus metrics. Um, so if you go to the AI, AI fairness toolkit, you can see how these these are defined, and then based on your use case, you pick one or the other. There is also a lot of guideline on which one to pick. So here's a, here's a question, right? So do SAT scores correctly compare the abilities of applicant? If you have an individual view where you think we are all equal and we all have an equal chance of passing this um, or doing well in it, and, and so then you can look at the individual metrics, for example, the average odds difference, and we'll, I'll show you what that looks like uh, or what that, what, is def, what that is defined as. Um, if you have a more of a group view, um, then you say, uh, actually, there's structural biases between each between multiple groups. So it may be that I'm coming from a family where English is my, you know, it's not my primary language, or maybe I'm coming from a low-income um, family, so I, I may not have enough money or resources to prep for SATs uh, like the other groups. And therefore, then you start looking at the group uh, biases and not individuals um, per se. In terms of when, when do you do this, there are multiple places where you can, uh, in your data science life cycle, that you can look for biases, right? So when you start off, you have your data, um, and then, what did you say? Explore, explore, explore? No, what was, yeah, so you do all of, <laughs> you do all of that. Um, clean, clean, clean. So you clean, 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 and then uh, the, at that point um, is, is where you could look for bias right in your data itself. Uh, and we look at some of the, the metrics that let you do that. Um, secondly, you, look, you can look at uh, while your model is being trained on your training data. So that's where you can, if you have the ability to change the model or if you have the ability to use uh, one of the models provided by uh, AI Fairness 360 Toolkit, then you can look at that. And the last is uh, on post-processing side, when, uh, you know, if you don't have any control on the raw data or you cannot change it, you can't touch it, and you can't touch the model itself, uh, then there is a way to influence the results that are coming out where you kind of fiddle around with the results to make it more fair for the unprivileged group. All right, so this is just saying what I, actually it's saying what I just said, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, here are some of the examples of different mitigation techniques that this toolkit provides. And again, they're divided between pre-processing on the data side, uh, in processing with the model and post-processing. Um, and actually, um, the cool thing I like about this toolkit is that all of these algorithms are coming from research papers. Uh, and so if you have, I, I am not going to, to, going to pretend like I understand most of these. Um, so I'm in the process of reading a lot of these myself. Uh, so if you have any questions, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can also go there and, and look at the papers themselves and then look at the code and how that um, algorithm was implemented. So, and I'm giving you a lot of links and information, but the hope is to kind of raise awareness about bias and modeling and then hopefully give, give you enough links to go um, do some research if you're using 
or if you're doing any modeling um, at work. All right, cool. Um, so a lot of these actually work on, uh, on the data side. You may be changing um, your data itself, um, or you may be changing uh, the labels, or you may be transforming your data to make it more favorable. Um, uh, and then the in-processing, you may be changing a lot of time. A lot of these algorithms also change the weights that are being passed into um, your actual models, right? So, so that's another way to do it. Um, so, so given that there are more than 75 uh, metrics and more than 10 of these algorithms you can use to mitigate bias, if you see any, um, how do you pick one, right? So that comes down to this. That comes down to uh, ask the question, what is your model, uh, what is the result of your model going to do, right? Is it doing good things or ba bad things to people? So if you're sending people to jail, then maybe it's okay to have more false positives than false negatives, and maybe you want to pick a metric that has these values or these, these ratios instead of doing something like statistical parity that doesn't look at false negatives or false positives. Um, on the other hand, if you're giving out loans, then it's okay to do more false, false negatives than, than false positives. So it's ask yourself how much damage can your model do, right? So that's one way to look at it. But essentially, working with stakeholder, or sorry, preventing bias is hard, right? There's, there's so much to look at. Um, so the first step is work with your stakeholders uh, to define what fairness is. Like we saw, it's, it's kind of hard to define, it can be vague. So given what you're trying to accomplish, you can maybe come up with a definition, and that would drive what metrics you pick for your, uh, for your bias. Um, mitigation techniques, sorry? Of course it is. Um, right, and then, this, this, the second point is apply it as early as possible. So you can apply it on your, if you can apply it on the, on the data, if you have the ability to look at that data and change it, then apply it there. Um, and the last thing with this framework, there's a caveat, it's, it's, it does well with um, certain kinds of data sets and certain kinds of use cases, and that is well defined on their uh, GitHub page. Um, so I know it does like classification and regression, those are the two, uh, and certain kinds of models within those two supervised learning uh, fields, I guess. Um, so um, it doesn't, you know, not work with every model out there, um, but it's a, it's a start. Oops. All right, I do want to give a shout out. I have like six minutes left. I want to give a shout out to is Tim around? Tim, Tim, Tim. Here. Oh, he's down there. So Tim uh, works with me. He's my colleague at IBM, and he's part of this data science community. Um, if you scan this uh, QR code, you get a free month of Coursera to do. I, um, is it IBM specializations or any specializations? IBM, IBM specializations, um, uh, which we have four of those on Coursera. So you get a free month to do those uh, specializations. So make use of that if you like. And then, um, <laughs> sorry, were you taking a picture? <laughs> Hurry up, I have like four minutes left. No, 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 I'll, I'll post it. This is uh, public, yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Please do share it with your friends, yes. Um, and then finally, if you want to learn more about the AI Fairness Toolkit, or if you have questions, all of the research team at IBM that know a lot more about this than I do uh, are at, on that Slack channel and answering questions. Um, so please, please uh, do ask questions there if you have any. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to show you, quickly show you the website. I have a couple of minutes left. So... All right, so this is the homepage for AI Fairness 360, and there's a couple of things going here. Like I said, there's a lot of information here that you can uh, use to learn about bias in different industries and different use cases. Uh, but I want to I want to show you this demo. So there's three different data sets in this demo. Uh, so the first one is the Compass data set we looked at, or the the you know the first example. The second one is from a credit company uh, in deciding if a customer is good to give out a loan to or not, or if they will return the loan on time or not. And the third one is the adult census income, and that's coming from UC Irvine. This is the data set. Um, and the idea here is given all of these variables, and you can see a lot of them are protected variables um, that you could discriminate using. Uh, um, so age, for example, uh, you know, um, race, sex, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is uh, you're building a classification model that will tell you if this person makes less than $50,000 a year or more than $50,000 a year. So if I were to pick that data set to run this demo, uh, behind the scenes now it's, check, it's checking for uh, bias in the data itself and it'll come back with the results here. 
Um, the one thing to remember when you're, when you're doing any of these bias exercises or fairness exercises, you need to define what the protected attribute is. It's, it's kind of hard to just give it a data set and say, hey, go do your thing, right? So you need to define who your privileged group is, unprivileged group is, and then what the protected data set, uh, protected column or attribute is. So once you do that, this one came back with, it found bias. Um, so in this case, the white uh, uh, group is the privileged and non-white is the unprivileged group. Uh, and then it's saying, if you apply no mitigation, the accuracy is 82%. Um, and it says it found two metrics out of five that show bias. And then it tells you what the biases are. Um, so with the statistical parity difference, you can click on this little thing. And again, it'll give you information on what this metric is. But essentially, this is saying that uh, the non-whites is 17% on average they get um, you know, the less than 50,000 classification um, than the, the white group. Uh, so that's just one example. Then they're looking at the protected attribute for sex uh, versus race here. And it's coming up with, diff with uh, similar biases, but different metrics at this, um, for this protected group or for this uh, protected attribute. Um, and then the next step would be to actually apply some of these mitigation techniques. Um, so let's use Reweighing, which is a pre-processing. So it works on your data itself. And then once the result comes back, you can see you can see how the bias has changed. So that's one thing. The other thing they're working on is, is explainability. So ex trying to explain how the uh, your mitigation technique actually removed that bias. So that's not here right now, but the API or the docs has some information on that. Um, the normally what happens is when you when you see this, your there's there's a um, like a tug of war between accuracy and your bias, right? So your accuracy usually goes down um, if you're trying to remove bias because you have, in the process of removing bias, you've changed data or you've changed your model or the output. So it no longer, no longer reflects the, the original data set and the biases that were in that original data, data set. So accuracy generally goes down, but to remove, remove all this bias and um, uh, uh, losing 1% of accuracy, maybe that's not such a bad thing, right? So depending on your use case, you have to then make that decision. All right, cool. I think, I think that, is, that is all I wanted to show. Um, yeah, thank you for having me.